everyone. Welcome to our uh, discussion today of the Academic Forum panel on, uh, to, uh, to, on online teaching. Why don't we start? Um, my name is Haigo Shagan. I'll be introducing the panelists as well as moderating uh, the discussion. Uh, let me just say a few words about the Academic Forum as a whole. We have monthly uh, meetings of this sort. We've already had one th once this year on, on benefits, on political action. Discuss, discussing the post-election outcomes, tenure, Article 24, state appropriations for education, and today is our panel on online teaching. The purpose of the academic forums for, uh, is to create a space for faculty to discuss and staff to discuss issues relevant to our lives at Wayne State, to empower the union with more visibility as well, and finally to have faculty and staff have a chance, depending on the forum discussion topic, to have a chance to impact policy itself because it's before it's finalized. And this is actually one of those uh, because today's discussion will uh, is on online teaching and you have in front of you the four uh, members of the union's committee uh, for online teaching. And so ideas and concerns you have, uh, hopefully will you'll be able to share them with us and they'll be reflected in the positions that the union takes in negotiations. Um, the academic forum is organized by the Council of Representatives of the AUPFT, whose chair is Kristen Chinnery, right there, Kristen. And the whole affair is uh, organized and, and assisted by Michelle Fecto, the executive director of the AUPFT, Michelle and Tammy, who is the executive assistant of the AUPFT, and she's right there. I'm going to um, forego any introductory comments except to say that there, is, there are a lot of issues involved in online teaching. Um, just to name a few is who owns the material, for example, because it is now online and publicly available, out of faculty control. Who decides, you know, what the faculty workload should be, and who decides, for example, whether the courses should be offered or not. And there are many other questions. We'll deal with these today as we get into the discussion. Uh, so let me uh, take this moment then to uh, also introduce to you or let you know who the administrators are from the administration side on the 2N committee. And before I introduce the union's uh, negotiators on it, on the administration side we have Ahmed Azadeen, who is the co-chair and associate vice president for education and outreach and international programs, Stephen Bajali, who is the associate dean and professor in the School of Library and Information, and Joseph Sawaski, chief information officer and associate vice president for computing and information technology, and Cheryl Waits, dean for the School of Social Work. On our side of the ledger, we have... Uh, the panel in front of you, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they're sitting. Nearest me is Pramod Khosla. Dr. Khosla is an associate professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Science, where he is currently the graduate program director. He has been working on diet and lipoprotein metabolism for almost 30 years. After obtaining his PhD from the University of Western Ontario in Canada, he did postdoctoral research at Brandeis University. Dr. Khosla is the author of some 80 plus articles including original research, book chapters, reviews, and commentaries. He has been involved in dietary fat-related research, education for almost 30 years, and given over 100 invited guest lectures and seminars in 20 different countries. He has supervised over 30 graduate students and taught over 80 courses, including several web-based online courses with enrollments from 10 to 400 students. In recent years, he has organized two major international symposia, on saturated and trans fats, in which some of the world's leading experts have participated. Over the last few years, Dr. Khosla's laboratory has also carried out studies in dialysis patients to look at the effects of various supplements on markers of inflammation, oxidative stress, and blood lipids. And a multi-centered clinical trial will be starting later this year. Dr. Khosla has served on numerous committees, salary, merit, faculty council, curriculum, academic senate. And he has also been involved with the AAUP since 2009. Dr. Khosla, Pramod, welcome. Sitting next to uh, Pramod is Charles Parrish. Professor Parrish teaches public administration, organization theory, and healthcare policy. His research interests are in comparative public administration, health policy, and gerontology. He has published on diverse topics, including comparative welfare policy, Latin American politics, aging policy, and civic development over the lifespan. His research has been funded by various sources, including the National Institute on Aging and the Andrus Foundation. He is a former chair of the Department of Political Science and was the director of the Wayne State University Institute of Gerontology for a number of years. 
He is president of the Wayne State University chapter of the American Association of University Professors, our union. Sitting next to Charlie, and welcome Charlie, is John Heinrichs. John Heinrichs is an associate professor in the School of Business at Wayne State University. Professor Heinrichs earned his PhD from the University of Toledo in Manufacturing Management and Information Systems in 2001. Hendricks has over 37 years of experience in the information technology field in positions of technical support, marketing, management, and professional education. Hendricks has earned awards for best paper from the Seoul Journal of Business, Decision, Science Institute, and the American Institute of Higher Education. He was the winner of the Sonic Foundry's Rich Media Impact Awards for Online Education and the PASS Second Place Award winner for Innovative Use of SQL Technology. Hendricks has been featured in, S in SPSS annual report in recognition of leading edge customer satisfaction applications and the ComShare annual report in recognition of leading edge use of business intelligence software applications. Hendricks has, has published over 25 articles in journals such as Computers and Human Behavior, Journal of Consumer Behavior, Journal of Internet Commerce, Journal of Strategic Marketing, Decision Support Systems, and many others. He has over 22 conference proceedings five book chapters, five books, including the Handbook of Social Interactivity, Marketing, Managing Traditional Online and Social Media Touchpoints, and has presented at multiple conferences. Heinrichs teaches in the master's program focusing on inbound information technology and related courses. Welcome, John. And sitting next to John is Veronica Bilak. Veronica is the Instruction Services Coordinator and Liaison Librarian to the College of Education and Department of Anthropology. Her responsibilities include coordinating the production and maintenance of the library systems, asynchronous online instruction at youtube.com, wsuinst.com, or org. She has presented and published several times on the topics of faculty librarian collaboration, course integrated information literacy instruction, and integrated technology into information literacy teaching. She has co-taught online courses in the Association of College and Research Libraries e-learning program and has collaborated with faculty to provide online synchronous and asynchronous library instruction in courses. She served on Wayne State University's online instruction task force in 2012. She is currently pursuing her education specialist certificate in Wayne State University's instructional technology program. Veronica, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, you as well again. Uh, we'll begin uh, the panel by uh, having each of the panelists present an initial statement, uh, five to ten minutes long, after which we'll open it up to questions from everyone, including myself and each of the panelists to one another as well. Uh, so I'd like to begin with uh, Professor Parrish. Charlie, if you could do an opening statement. Okay. The, uh, you have a handout to which I will refer here. Uh, it, it was quite useful uh, handout prepared by the AAUP for the Summer Institute. Uh, uh, CBC is the uh, collective bargaining uh, uh, committee. And uh, th this was prepared by Marty Kitch of Wright State and Martin Snyder at the National Ta Task Force. It is a informative pr uh, uh, presentation. This will be on the uh, this will be on the website. So if you want to download the PowerPoint presentation itself, that's fine. But I'm just going to refer to a few uh, of the slides here to get the, to set the uh, to, to um, sort of set the overview of this. Uh, on the first page of your of your thing, your the three slides start with the overview of issues or the place that I think we should quickly review what the issues are: the governance. Uh, who decides whether to offer online courses and who decides what to teach. That really must reside in the uh, in the those people who are teaching this. Uh, the faculty, uh, 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 the, the faculty. There is in the back here a sort of AAUP on. Uh, It's a set of principles, anyway. You'll find it there that are that basically talk about academic freedom and the, and the issues that are involved. Who controls the academic freedom? Who controls the curriculum and the syllabus design? That is very important. Uh, the uh, when you look at that in the context of intellectual property, 
you have to make a distinction. If, if, a, if, a, if a course is prepared by a faculty member uh, in uh, the course of the regular curriculum and academic, uh, uh, academic process, then that course is basically belongs to the faculty member. And the, the uh, university does not have that. Uh, it does not have, have access to using that in other contexts. Uh, when they do, they've done it, but when they do, they can be stopped from doing that. However, if, it, if someone is assigned, and the academic staff, I think, are more, uh, are more subject to this, where someone is assigned to develop a course or a set of materials and so on, that is viewed as work for hire. Work for hire, the product belongs to the organization assigning this. And that's an important distinction. So those things that are, that are developed individually in the course of your work, uh, if, if you're doing it in the course of your work, and then you offer it to the to uh, the administration, that's yours. That's yours. You can you, they can be copyrighted, copyrighted as soon as you write it, actually. But uh, but if you're assigned to do it, and you're told to write up do this particular class for this particular reason and so on. That can be argued to be work for hire. And in, in that case, they, it belongs to the university. Uh, who owns the course material? What controls the faculty member have over this? Workload. Uh, down to the lower left. Uh, how, is it, how do you calculate workload? We don't have at this university a set of, uh, a set of, uh, of workload uh, uh, standards because of the diversity of the university. We know that in the chemistry department, the national standard is one course a semester. In other departments, it's two courses a semester. In other departments, it's three courses a semester. It all depends upon a, and if you start going to the medical school and figuring out a course load, you know, you may need a psychiatrist. The, uh, the problem is very complicated. So there's no way. Many of these workloads that are in the workloads that are included in, uh, in faculty contracts are come from the model of, of former teaching colleges, in which is often quite elaborately set out in the uh, in the contract what what workload is, how it's how it is altered, and, and so on. Uh, but this is an important issue, uh, and I think Ramu is going to talk a little talk about that. Uh, technical problems, student identities. You know, you have 200 students, and, <laughs> and you want to. It's hard enough to figure out who they are, uh, having taught 250 students and so on. I can recognize often their faces, but I can't if they're standing sideways because there's only I see them from the, from the front, <laughs> and. Uh, and getting their names, giving online tests, that's a, a real challenge. And uh, the certification question is, is another one that, we, that we're going to have to deal with. Finances. How, how do we deal with the finances of, of uh, this and, and uh, of the uh, online? Uh, there's a great idea, there's an idea that many had with these, the advent of the MOOCs, uh, the... Uh, uh, these large courses that are being that are being told uh, the, uh, the that people are being told let's just bring the knowledge of MIT to the world and everybody takes it and so on. The record of MOOCs is very checkered, and uh, but however there are many of the uh, there are many of the uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, and hedge fund operators and so on who have seen a big opportunity. There are billions of dollars that go to university, to, to university tuition across the country. And if they can just steal some of that, they can have a very profitable organization. And we have a whole series of, uh, of people that are spit off uh, to, run, to uh, teach in these, in, in these ways. The, uh, but some of them have ended up going out of business. Uh, if you turn... Uh, I don't have the, when it was printed out, it's actually slide 21, and that's about halfway through, but, uh, uh, 
Well, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, technical considerations on page seven. Uh, these are the same things that I think we will also will certainly have to deal with. Anyway, the technical considerations are important, uh, and uh, we'll, we can uh, certainly talk about these. We want to make sure that the people who are who are teaching in these areas of areas uh, are uh, qualified to teach online. Uh, they uh, are they can they don't run into technical problems they can't that they can't deal with. Uh, so the so the idea of what kind of support you have you know, here it would be for the office of teaching and learning, and they are just uh, what has happened administratively as best I can understand. And I've been in the announcement. The responsibility for the systems education was in the office of the uh, Esedin, uh, uh, and uh, he. But however, he has, I think, handed this over to uh, Madulet, the, the head of, uh, of teaching and learning, and that has not yet been really well defined. So we're in the early stages. We've had a lot of teaching online. We have something like ten percent of our of our uh, of our. Uh, uh, credit hours, I think, are online already. And so uh, we have a lot of problems involved with this. I'm just going to leave it at that and uh, let the others contribute uh, within their sort of general context. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Ramon, do you want to go next? Because you yeah, are most familiar you. with this document. Yeah, I think. yeah. yeah. The, the, this was brought to us by Promote who went to the summer in 2013. Yeah, actually, there are several issues in here which are really important. And once we start a dialogue, we'll all come up with different things. But what I wanted to sort of just start a conversation was related to faculty workload and the fact that faculty workload, how do we assess online? And I'm going to give some examples out without naming any departments or whatever. And these are things that have cropped up in the last couple of years. Um, so you have a scenario where you've got 400 students and then you assign X number of TAs to look after Know, certain students on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's, let's say it's a three-credit class. So does the faculty get credit for actually teaching a three-credit class when they've got all this automated? Um, there have been examples of faculty volunteering to do an online class because then they don't have to be on campus. So should we have some rules about that? I travel a lot, and um, yeah, I can see the advantage of online. If I don't have to be around, should there be some rules related to that? We now have um, annual reviews where it is tied into your performance, and if things are not up to you know, scratch, there's going to be remediation. So what happens with online? If you've got a faculty member teaching assigned to 70 students, yet it's all automated, a lot of the intro textbooks, especially in our field, are now coming ready-made for automation, <coughs> and essentially you have to upload to Blackboard, and you, know, you can take the semester off because the there's a site that the book provides which actually runs everything for you, right down to administering on exams. When it comes to student identity, there's been an issue related to um, monitoring, and there was a case about two weeks ago, I forget the university, some of the students have actually complained that they don't want online monitoring because it's very intrusive, and the Board of Governors at the university has actually acquiesced and agreed to the students' demand. I'm sort of getting off uh, kilt here. I really want to discuss the workload issue. So getting back to the workload issue, what are the metrics? And this is not just for online. Charlie mentioned that we don't have anything here. So how do you compare workload for somebody who teaches a three-hour live class where they're in the classroom three hours a week versus somebody who maybe is in charge of a lab class, they give an initial you know, half an hour spiel, and then TAs run the rest of the class. Those that run seminars. What's the workload equivalent for somebody who's doing a live class? If you're doing an online section and you have multiple assistants, what is the workload for that? Once a faculty member has set up a class and it's been automated, and the following year the chair assigns somebody else. I've had students come to me, Professor Kostler, you did this class today. Can I borrow your material? What happens then? Okay. Or if it's a new faculty member comes in, you know, promote, you've done this before, can I get some pointers? And they can just show you know, I want to help out. You give it to them. And next thing you know, they're actually taking your material, which is online, and then maybe tweaked it a little bit. And then on the books is they've done a three-hour class when they actually haven't done any work because it's all been done for them. So, so those are the sorts of issues I think we have to start 
getting a group around. And it's been too long, I think, that we haven't done anything. I've seen metrics from other universities where they have charts on their websites approved by Board of Governors which says if you are teaching a three-hour live credit class and you're teaching a lab class, that would be equivalent to one credit hour. If you're doing a seminar, it's going to be equivalent to this much. If you're doing a online class with X number of students, that will count for some number of credits. Uh, so I think the sooner we grapple with this, the better, because otherwise at an annual review, we're going to get scenarios where people are going to start complaining. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I put in X amount of work. I come in every, you know, twice a week at 8 a.m. And here is someone who's constantly saying back, online doing stuff which is automated, somebody else is doing it for them. So how can you say my teaching load was the same as this person's? So something to think about. Uh, we need to take it some other you. issues. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, John, you want to carry on? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think this is a very exciting time. I think it's a very exciting topic. Uh, I've been doing uh, online teaching now for a little over 10 years, and each time you do it, it's different, and it's exciting, and it provides you with someone new to, to, to work with. The interesting things, and I'm not going to hit a faculty workload, but that I wonder about is thinking about it from a student perspective. The issues of technical support, where you have the students coming to you and expecting you to solve all the technical issues. Uh, I don't think a semester has gone by where I've not picked up a piece of uh, information from a student that's contained a virus, or malware, or adware. And how do you get help with the students to get that fixed? <coughs> right now, Wayne State doesn't provide, or if they do provide, it's not very really obvious help in that area. So some of the things and the tools that you provided. So I'd like to spend a little bit with the uh, technical support. How can you know who's watching it? How can you know when they're watching it? Do you care if they watch it? Do you care if they open their email? We're sitting now in a, a, an environment with the, with the homeland generation, or if you will, the generation Y, that sits there and they're heavy mobile, heavy video. They work different. So the question is, is how can you reach out with, and unfortunately some of the tools that we have can't support that. And we're stuck with technology that just doesn't work. So how do you reach out? And unfortunately right now it's called you open your wallet and you pay for it. And if you want to have a good class because you're hit with a set score, you're stuck doing that. So those are some of the issues that I get faced with and are working on. Some of the other things that you're going to get hit with is set scores. And what's interesting on the set scores is if you don't know who the opinion leader in your class is, they can drift the set scores up to three, four points downward or upward. So the question is, is how do you control or know or reach out to those individuals that are doing that? There's been tremendous research on how different people work or learn. There's been tremendous differences by gender, by technology, by skill. And how do we reach and work with those uh, individuals as well? And I think that's, a, that's an interesting thing. The other thing that you have to be very careful of, and I really love help on, is copyright issues. How do you reach out and ensure that the students, if they're writing something to you, have fairly acquired the image. We know Wayne State provides that for some of the marketing. Well, we would like some of that so that we can incorporate copyrighted items into our class. I have students from all over the country. How do they get library support when you demand research things? How do they get to that? So from a student perspective, I need, and I know I can't get it, but I'd love to have, a dedicated librarian that I could embed into my course so that they could help the students when they're required to do research and to work into those areas. So there's many variety of things to accomplish. Um, I'd like to see some support in our technical area. I'd like to see some better technical tools. I'd like to see uh, an outreach in that. Thank you, John. And Veronica? Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be on this two-end committee, especially since I'm an academic staff member and I'm not a faculty member. Um, 
I think I bring a unique perspective, though, because many of us as academic staff provide a lot of support to students who are taking online courses. And um, I think it's critical that, that those concerns be part of this discussion, even though um, this really relates to faculty and online teaching. So my experience with courses has been <laughs> from all levels. I'm a student in an online, in an online program. I am um, an uh, adjunct faculty that has taught a blended class. And I've also provided support to students um, and faculty through the library system as a librarian. So I really see a lot of different <coughs> issues and problems that, um, and positive things too that come from our online course offerings. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that I was focused on the right things uh, for this committee. And my understanding is, is that our primary focus is negotiating wages, hours, and working conditions as they relate to teaching. Um, because this is what can be negotiated with administration as part of the contract. So what I'm going to talk about sort of focuses on those issues. So um, in reviewing the Article 25 language, which I think is published in the contract, is that correct, or is it just the letter? The actual Article 25 language that was, that was proposed. proposed. Yeah. Um, I have to say, honestly, I, I don't know what the problem was with it. There was, there was, it was very focused, very reasonable. Um, there was very little that I found in it that I felt just from a, my objective standpoint would need additional consideration. So having said that, I think we have a really solid starting point. There's nothing there that I think is really that contestable. Um, my concerns uh, relating to online teaching at Wayne State specifically relate to the support from the institution for faculty and students. Um, the Online Learning Consortium recently revised its quality scorecard, and I know when faculty hear that, they're like, eh, don't check boxes. But here's the thing. On this quality scorecard, over 50% of the items on this scorecard related to institutional support for infrastructure, faculty, and students. So even when other um, agencies uh, that are looking at your quality of online education, they're looking at that quality not just from the teaching themselves, but from what support is being provided by the, by the administration. So I'm sure for any of you, I've been here 14 years. Um, the university's commitment to providing sufficient funding and administrative support for online courses has not been consistent in the past. They really don't have a good tra track record. I've seen several starts and stops of um, we're going to push online education, they create a uh, department, they create, they hire somebody, they get an infrastructure, and then it goes away. And so really, it has been up to faculty. The only reason we have online courses is because of dedicated faculty that have really tried hard to make sure that this gets going, and that it is quality, and it is giving students what they need. Um, we need to structure our, the language in Article 25 in a way that holds the administration accountable for a governance structure with appropriate budget allocations that provides for sustainable online education. Um, and it needs to support learning outcomes and student retention. Student retention is a big deal. There are several studies out there that show, especially in undergraduate students who are underprepared, they do not stay in online courses. And that impact on our retention right now is something we can ill afford. Um, Charlie referred to testing, um, and I think this brings up a bigger issue is that even in our face-to-face -face instruction, we do not have a lot of the infrastructure that supports, we don't, we don't have a testing center um, online that um, students can go to to get uh, monitored testing. Um, John's issue regarding copyright, the library uh, has sort of become the de facto copyright experts. We personally don't want that mantle. Um, we, are, we are happy to provide support when it comes to teaching and learning. But the fact is, is that this is a big university without a copyright lawyer on staff. This is a serious problem. Um, and we also need to have reasonable expectations for the learner. I, I don't want to criticize Blackboard because they do a really good job and the people who work on their staff are wonderful. But the fact is, we don't have support for students when it comes to using Blackboard. And being at the library's reference desk, I can tell you, again, we've become the de facto help desk for helping students get through Blackboard who may have trouble. And those of you um, who have been 
who are teachers and faculty here understand that students come to you with a variety of um, levels of expertise when it comes to technology. And John <coughs> spoke to some really major issues that fortunately I've never had. But I mean, having a student uh, turn in a paper that's loaded with malware or a virus <laughs> is a really scary thing. Um, I'm also really concerned with faculty ownership rights as they relate to online course development and teaching. And again, there needs to be a sustainable way. We need to be able to acknowledge that there is this model that um, for multi-section gen ed courses, but we need to make sure that we adequately compensate faculty who work on the development of those courses. Because if they then become work for hire, they, they need to make sure that that's worth their while. Um, I'm also really concerned with workload rules, especially as they relate to appropriate class sizes. This also is me as a student. Uh, being in a, a big online class, I resented being in a big face-to-face -face class when I was a grad student, paying huge amounts of tuition and having 30 other students in my class. Really? I, I just thought that was a little outrageous. And so I think that, that um, again, appropriate class sizes is an important thing and also instructional support. Um, and these, are, these concerns are articulated already in the Article 25 draft, and I think they need to be included in any subsequent language. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we have today. Um, I, I want to hear people's concerns and comments regarding wages, hours, and working conditions. And I want to think about how we can structure this language so it can also reflect uh, how we can adequately respond to demands from students for online courses while maintaining our overall instructional and educational quality. Veronica, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is ask a few questions and then open it up to all of you to answer any of the questions that have come up already, and as well as I'll open up to anyone who has questions here. So let me ask you the following uh, um, from me. Um, are, can faculty be required to teach online classes? Uh, no one no one has brought this up. Um, secondly, is there an impact here beyond the university when potentially you have thousands of students not coming downtown? Uh, whereas Wayne is part of the development of downtown, there are a lot of things down here predicated on having people down here, spending money and being down here, living down here. Um, is, is this an issue in this bigger conversation? And, and does that lead to capping online classes at a certain number? Should there be some percentage of a department's course load that's maximally online? Um, has that, is that part of the discussion? And, and so lastly, also, to take into account the fact that this issue has been in the contract for over a year now, and that nothing's been done on it, then does, does the delay indicate anything? Does the delay have any implications in terms of the university's seriousness about, about engaging with this issue? So those questions, as well as the things that you brought up, each of you individually, any one of you would like to uh, take the next? John, you're looking at me in an interesting... Um, you brought up the one thing that I, did, I laugh about, which was, uh, should online be uh, capped? I wanted to share a story with you. Is one of the classes I taught online. I stood in front of a camera, and it was just me in the room like this. And I heard out of the... Uh, as I was doing class, I heard myself wait a minute, I'm, I'm getting feedback, what's wrong? There was a student group that decided to be a learning community. They didn't want to sit in my class, they sat in the break room where they could have coffee, pause and stop me, talk about what I was talking, then hit play. But So the idea of can you come and bring the students together, wouldn't it be exciting to have learning communities of students in an online fashion so that they could watch and, and come together and work as a team? as a different model for online. So anyways, I thought that was an exciting uh, uh, component. You know, I, I would say that <clears throat> one of the problems that, that uh, we have with the develop we have with the development of online here is that it, there's no integrated philosophy. If there's any integrated philosophy, it's sort of let's make as much money as we can out of it. <laughs> and uh, and Ahmad is a dean is good at thinking about those things. And he pretty, pretty much had responsibility for this, and I don't blame him for you know, for running along the way he was, the way he did it. He would parse out some of his incentives to departments to have some online and so on. But we got a tremendous variety of online. We had uh, we have 
classes being taught <laughs> by lecturers and by part-timers and by graduate students. And it's easy because they're easily they're under the administrative uh, uh, res responsibility of department chairs. And so they can point them, they can tell them. So the TA comes in and says, what should I do? I said, yeah, teach this online course. And what does the TA say? You can't say that to faculty members. Uh, to most faculty members, you get away with it. So it's a really, uh, those are really important kinds of issues. One of the things that relates to that is how this, these four people were constituted. First of all, we have all of these, we have a number of people who are lecturers who are very experienced in online, uh, in, in the technical problems and so on of online. But uh, frankly, I did not, and the executive committee uh, did not want to put on a negotiating team, a negotiating group, people who were vulnerable to administrative re retaliation. And uh, uh, so we wanted, the priority was tenured and, or ESS. And uh, those others who were out there who had much expertise and beyond mine, uh, certainly we were asked them to contribute and there would be meetings along the way to, uh, to do that. But uh, and you have to recognize that uh, the non-renewal of somebody is a, is a big club. But Johnny, on that, on that topic, what do you think will be the contentious issue in this negotiation? Well, I don't think the other side has thought it out. <laughs> So I'm not sure what the most contentious issue is going to be. Uh, so we have copyright covered in the contract. Actually, it was, I can tell you the story of that. The, uh, uh, we were negotiating some long while ago. Uh, in the early 90s, we were with Adam and we were negotiating patent and copyright issues. And uh, we got down to the point where the copyright issue, we couldn't agree on it. The patent thing we did agree upon, and we, it's a pretty generous uh, a uh, situation where if you get a patent, you get to, if the university chooses to support it, you get a considerable, you get a good royalty from from how it's developed and so on. Copyright was more difficult. Uh, and finally, at the end, because we couldn't come across, the, uh, come to a consensus, to an agreement, not a consensus, uh, on copyright, we decided, well, what we will do, and this is our proposal, is that we have a... Uh, uh, we, the university makes a proposal, and we will make a proposal. And then we'll submit it to an arbitrator, and the arbitrator will decide which of those two proposals is most like what we have. And so uh, we thought about it, and uh, the, uh, we submitted the existing policies. And it's hard for the arbitrator not to say, this is most like the existing policy, it is the existing policy. <laughs> So this was one of those those small victories over David Adame that we did get. Uh, he had not thought of that. But uh, so we have a pretty traditional copyright thing in which the copyrights of the individual uh, are pretty well protected, unless it's work for hire. In, the, in that case, it's something else. Can yeah. you elaborate on the work for hire? Because I'm having trouble distinguishing, as a tenure track faculty member, the difference between being um, as to teach a course, which most likely means you're developing that course. Yeah. Um, so I don't really understand the distinction between asking an adjunct to teach a course that's developing that course or a tenure track. Well, adjuncts have, have, have less uh, uh, less resources. A faculty member, you're asked to teach a course. That's asked to teach an online course is no different than if you're a new hired, newly hired faculty member and uh, you haven't taught a course in a particular area, and we say, this is a course we really need, given your expertise, would you teach a course in this? And you develop it as yours. Now, it's the same with online. Uh, just because it's online, it's not different in terms of the curriculum from our point of view. Now, from the university's point of view, the, the, and some administrative point of view, it may be different. But that's why you have a union. And, uh, but uh, you can be sure that we will, that the union will defend your copyright on the, on the courses. So I, I don't know if that so helps. So the notion that, uh, you know, you develop the course and let's say the big issue now, I'm just going to use an example, summer teaching. So you develop the course, it's a blackboard course, uh, 
you know, you put all your, your intellectual muster into right. it, and then um, an adjunct approaches you and to ask you for the materials to teach that course. What? And I know this varies department to yeah. department, and even within departments, you know, some courses there's more of an open policy right. to share, and the other higher level courses there's not. I guess I'm, because if it's a work for hire situation, then that adjunct then develops that course, and then basically I feel like, you know, why would a full time person ever teach that course again? Because the adjunct has been given the course to teach, and so they become the work for hire. And yeah, you. Well, that's not for work for hire exactly. It's merely that they're teaching the course and you that you have given them material to do it. They can be hired or not hired each semester. In these, in these well, well, I mean, an sort of extension of that would be a class with multiple sections where different people are teaching, but it's they're all online. And so you obviously need the same class because there are multiple sections of the same course. And who owns that? And, and how is that? Well, I think it's owned by the faculty member who developed the course. But and I think that's, that's a bigger issue because yeah. um, I know right now they're, I'm pretty sure in English they're working on something like that for English 1020, for both face-to-face -face and online. Mm -hmm. And it's being, it's there's like a program coordinator and it's being developed by a group. Mm -hmm. And so and so that's why, to me, the issue there is compensation. You know, some entry level gen ed courses are, are um, as you said, they're text, very textbook driven. Yeah. And, the te you know, you can just buy a textbook and plug it into Blackboard and you're good to go. So, so I think, I think there's some nuances there that really need to be thought out. And what, what I want, what I would want to make sure of, what my argument would be is I want faculty to be compensated appropriately for contributions that they make, especially because I, I think a lot of times the development for some of these online courses falls to people, like you said, the grad students and the lecturers, people who are, are, don't, are not as protected and therefore have issues arguing for um, their, what they should be compensated for, what would be fair and equitable but for what they're doing. Let me pose another example that's more ambiguous than work for hire. Suppose a department chair says, look, uh, we need a course in this area online. Uh, and what, we, what I talk with the dean, and we can get you X thousand dollars this summer to develop that course. That comes pretty close to work for hire. Yes. Yeah. Okay, oh, I'd like to cite Jessica Littman, who was here and is now with you about, and she contends that this is much more of an open issue, and that it has not been determined by right. the courts, and the contract solves it here. I believe that the University of Michigan formally states they own everything with faculty members. Some so places do. And she In says Oklahoma, that they actually keep the copyright of articles there. The, the, the Board of Trustees said that the, the copyright of all the articles you publish are theirs. And, and she almost hopes that it never goes to the courts because there is enough in what we do that the university might win a case that everything we do is a work for hire because yeah. we get supported by the institution. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Um, the problem that we're having in my department, African American Studies, is dealing with the uh, promotion and tenure issue with SAT scores. So when we teach an online class, and when I've done this in the past, the response rate from students for SAT scores is amazingly low, to the point where they, you just don't won't get a score. And so how do we deal with that in terms of promotion and tenure if you have faculty members that are te teaching the majority of their classes online and they have no SAT scores. I, I want to add to that question and just say that the indication there is that the quality of online teaching is 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 the students aren't seeing that as a yeah. quality venture. And that may and that's and the question is, is that truly because of the faculty teaching the class? Or does that have to do with the administration's refusal to look at any infrastructure for online teaching beyond Blackboard? And is the implication of what you're saying that set scores are going to be lower just well, by nature? Well, I would refer back to Veronica's point that student retention is abysmal in online classes and that that's a real issue for Wayne State. No, but even if they do respond. Even if they do respond, they are perceiving the quality of those experiences as far lower than in class experiences. Well, there's another issue too, and that is 
that the SAT scores aren't worth a damn. Any of them. Well, that's, and, not, but, that's, I mean, that's not an issue that we can address through this, right. through this we, instrument. Well, that's a side issue. You it's true. Is concerned. It's a true concern, but... Yeah. Well, Rita Casey can give you a book and verse on that. Sure. But she has worked on the, uh, on the SAT. It, it, it comes up time and again. Just, just, that's, so we've, got, we've got about ten minutes to go. Uh, this time runs quickly on these things. So, yes. I'd like to address Veronica's issue. One of the biggest concerns that I have is the lack of support. Right. The lack of support. And it is, um, I, I see that the OTL is, is, is trying, but the OTL has instructional designers who are not faculty, so they don't have the same perspective that a teaching faculty does, and they're not able to, to provide um, the more advanced level kinds of uh, applications or training that we need. So I, 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 that is one of my bigger frustrations. I think that as it relates to students, I think that the institution could do a better job of preparing students to use whatever management system we have. Right. Um, and I don't think they do a good job of that. So if we're going to negotiate some of the things that are important to me, and I teach exclusively online and have for the last 10 years. So I speak from a knowledge base. I would like to have, first of all, a much more stronger student support. And it can be either online student support, the Blackboard student guide that they have now, and the Blackboard student training for using our system is horrible. So it, it, it needs to be really revamped, and it needs to be done correctly. So I would suggest that. Suggestion number two is to have faculty. They have a faculty fellow now. I was a faculty fellow there. But they need to have faculty who work with other faculty to deliver or design instructional modules. All right? Because what you've learned, what I've, I heard you talk about, well, I have a strategy for that, but I don't even know you. <laughs> so, and, and that's not a negative. That's a fact. I have a strategy for that. There is no clearinghouse for us to share uh, practices or best practices, best practices for us here at Wayne State University, which is very different than another institution. So those are the two key things that, if you, as part of the negotiation, speaking from an experience base, and I was here when we did web. I was in the pilot group for WebCT, so I've been doing this a long time. All right. So those are the two things that I would encourage. And, oh, and one other thing. When you talk about intellectual property and online course design, there's a back door for that. Closed back door. All right? <laughs> Closed back door. I, I'm not going to articulate what the back door is right here, but there's a back door for that. And part of the issue is I know how to go around that back door. And I can, the course that you created, you're gone, you're gone, you're gone at University of Arkansas, I can get your course. You'll never know about it. That's the back door. I think that you make a really good point, yeah. Marilyn, is that there is there's a lack of communication between policies and procedures for Blackboard and faculty input on that. Even when it comes to things like upgrades, making making um, things in the course available, that there's there's technology that we would have access to, but but they've chosen not to turn those things on, and and that. Those decisions don't necessarily come from um, a teaching and learning perspective. So, and and you're absolutely right. It's like the way that courses are retained, the way that's that has there's there's no communication with faculty about those whatsoever. And again, like I said, Blackboard. I mean, if you if you, if you look at their staff, probably compared to other institutions, it's like please. We are, we are just chronically understaffed at this institution in every department, every program, every everything. So um, I, I certainly don't want to criticize Blackboard because what they do with what they have is incredible. But um, it's just, like, again, like I said, there isn't a concerted effort um, at the administrative level to really address these issues and problems with online teaching and learning, which have been around for years. I mean, Geraldine, if you you were one of the pioneers here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can yeah. tell you stories. Yeah. One other thing that I want to share along that line. The decisions, what Veronica is talking about, and I've encountered this, I've been working on a project, and I've discovered that the application can do X, Y, and Z. Well, why can't it do X, Y, and Z here? It's because one person made the decision not to turn that switch on. 
and there is no recourse, there's no, there's no vehicle for us to say, okay, well, I want to do this and thus and so in the class, you need to turn that switch on. And depending on what day of the week it is, what mood she's in, or whether she's having PMS or a hot flash, and I'm just, I'm being real honest about it. I'm being real honest about it, whether or not I get that switch turned on. All right, and it, it, I shouldn't have to go through that. I shouldn't have to go through that because I, I have a curriculum background. I know what I'm asking you for. Let's. Uh, we have five minutes to go, and I'll take one more question. I'm going to ask Pramod and John to answer because we haven't heard you that much. Uh, it's a statement and a question combined. Um, one of the things is, is that undergraduate education and graduate education have some different um, responsibilities and some different ways of being delivered online. And my experience with online education, and I've been doing it for 15 years, um, but I'm an education technology person. Um, at the graduate level, and I've been keeping track of my hours, teaching in-person class, the same class online, three to five times the amount of time to teach the online class. Because, and part of that is the ongoing communication, it's like teaching 30 independent studies as opposed to a single class. And so that's just something I want to get out into the conversation. And that we may have this variety of online teaching across the university that needs to be considered when we're talking about um, workload, teaching conditions, um, and it's just, I think it's more a, a statement. Thank you. John, and then I'll leave the last word to Brian. John. Oh, thank you. I, I, I loved hearing everything that everybody's been saying, especially one that I really love is the idea of students. We've really got to train them how to do online. I agree wholeheartedly. And, and it's, how do you email? What is a proper professional email to the instructor? Expectations, if you email at midnight, three in the morning, it's not a proper expectation. Uh, so I, I would wholeheartedly agree and support your idea. We've got to help the students become professionals, because I think that's, that's critical. Right. Promote last word. Um, well, actually, I mean, so there are so many things that have come up, and I'm sure there's a lot more, but I think class size, and that goes back to your question, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, that's absolutely critical. We had directives from our college administration over the last couple of years for online classes, just no cap. Now, any, any level, no cap, that's yeah. impossible. And yet we have students who will come in, they will enroll, these are freshmen, they don't even, they've never experienced online. You start getting emails like, I've registered for your class, now what do I do? All right? <laughs> now, this is not, that sort of ties in again with support. Um, what the administration sees, what we see are two completely different things. Uh, I, I guess one thing we haven't said is that we, not, we realize online education is here to stay, and there's lots of positive, you know, nobody's arguing with that. But if it's going to be done properly, the university has to invest. And it has to be a long-term strategy. It cannot be, well, this semester we'll try this, and next semester we'll try that. You have to do it long-term. We've got instructions for developing master's degrees online. You know, as many different uh, courses, well, uh, classes you can put online so we can have a master's degree that will attract more students. Well, what about the quality of education? One thing that hasn't been said is, if I'm looking at a transcript and somebody's taking a class, in an online class, and they have the same grade, did they learn the same thing? Okay. And I guess this is a debate that is, you know, going on nationwide and worldwide. Now, it's something we need to be cognizant of, but I certainly think capping of class size is absolutely critical, and depending on what class it is, maybe an intro class is one thing, but a graduate class with 70 students? Okay, if you get 70 the students, graduate great, but... level, I would contend they learn more. Yeah. All right. Well, okay, our time is up, everyone. Uh, Let me make one last announcement. An announcement. Uh, this is a very useful interaction here. It's too short. What I think we ought to do is to have a uh, is to have this committee here meet on a regular basis with people who are interested in in this, and so that we have another larger committee on which to bounce ideas off of. Because this, I think we've only just scratched the surface in the talk here. 
Uh, I was going to actually suggest that we do have this again next semester and, and have a chance to really expand on this discussion. Maybe the committee have some initial points that they want to really focus on as negotiating points that we can actually lead as a discussion topic. Because right now everything is on the table kind of, and, 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 and there's, you know, it's too early to have a focus on this, but it's a, it's, it's a critical issue. It's going to affect all our lives. Thank you everyone for coming, and thank you for the panelists for being with us as well.